Good evening to uh, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have the honor to introduce Professor Eric Jones, who will be giving us uh, the lecture tonight. Uh, this will be broadcast live uh, on YouTube, and uh, you'll be able to revisit it for those of you who want to see uh, the arguments once again. Uh, after my introduction, uh, Professor Jones will uh, give his lecture. Uh, then I'll maybe ask him a question or two, and then we'll open it to the floor uh, for a uh, discussion. Um, Professor Jones is the Albert Hirschman guest uh, this month uh, at the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, Eric is a professor of European Studies and International Political Economy and also the Director of European and Eurasian Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and he's uh, based uh, in Bologna. Uh, additionally, he's also a Senior Research Associate at the Istituto per gli Studi di Politica Internazionale in Milan. Uh, Eric Jones has a, an outstanding uh, academic uh, career as a political scientist and political economist, a uh, specialist on European affairs. He has taught at the Central European University uh, while the campus was still in Prague, uh, following that at uh, the University of Nottingham in the UK from 99 to 2004, and then uh, in Bologna at Johns Hopkins. Uh, if I were to read his CV, I think we would fill, out the, fill up the time uh, of, of this lecture. So I will just give you some uh, essential highlights. He is, of course, the author of uh, many books, of many edited uh, volumes, uh, collaborates in a number of journals, has lectured in many uh, European and American universities. He has uh, published uh, The Politics of Economic and Monetary Union in 2002, uh, Weary Policeman, American Power in the Age of Austerity in 2012, and The Year of European, uh, the, year the European Crisis Ended in 2014. He is, uh, and this will be the, the subject of the lecture tonight, he is looking at the way that the transformation of advanced uh, industrial democracies is uh, evolving from both a political and economic point of view. I'll leave it at that and invite Professor Jones to give his lecture. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Ivan. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a huge honor and privilege for me to be here. Um, I, I love being in Vienna. I've, I've had a long association with the Diplomatic Academy, but this is my first time at the Institute. Um, and, and I have to say, it's been a delightful experience. So I can't, I can't thank you enough for that. Um, I, I had expected when I came that, that this was gonna be one of those work in progress uh, conversations, and so I hope you don't mind uh, if I give you a work in progress as opposed to a completed argument. Uh, alas, I've been progressing on this work for about 25 years now, uh, so, so I, I think it's a very slow progress um, that I have to report. And, and, and what I'd like to do is to, to talk about two different developments that I've been following over the last 25 years um, one is the, the increasing complexity or the increasing difficulty that economic policymakers are having steering the macro economy. This is something I, I just came from the, the Austrian National Bank this morning, and this is something that, that I think you can find macroeconomic policymakers complain about quite readily. It used to be easier to steer the macro economy, and now it's more challenging, and, and, and it's not quite clear uh, why that's so, although we have a number of hypotheses. Um, the other is that it, it seems to be increasingly difficult for politicians, particularly politicians from mainstream political parties, to manage democratic processes. They seem to have a harder time getting elected. They have a harder time staying in office. Uh, and, and I think if we went to any of the major political parties, particularly on the center left, but, but also on the center right, uh, you would find that they complain about that 
quite readily as well. And so the question that I've been, I, I've been asking myself is, since these two difficulties have arisen over the same period of time, um, is there any way in which these things are connected? Is there any linkage between the difficulty that we have steering the macro economy and the difficulty that we have uh, managing democratic processes? Now, I ask this question not because I think that there's some silver bullet argument that we could make, a single monocausal explanation that ties one to the other in any kind of a direct way, um, but, but rather because I think it allows us to elaborate themes that might be important that are going to move back and forth across these two dimensions, back and forth between the management of the economy uh, and, and, the, and the management of democratic political processes. Now, like I said, this is a work in progress. There are many of these themes, but I want to illustrate the argument that I'm trying to make with three themes in particular uh, this evening. It's a work in progress, so none of these themes have elegant names. Um, the first theme is uh, the disintermediation of traditional political institutions. The second theme is the delegitimation of non-majoritarian institutions. And the third theme is the abrogation of American global leadership. Um, and, and, and I'm going to address each of those uh, in turn and hopefully um, generate at least enough provocation so that when we get to the question and answer, you can help me figure out uh, what I should be doing for the next quarter century. Let's start with the disintermediation of traditional political institutions. Now, I wanted to give this a really cool name like populism. Uh, and in fact, we use the word populism in the title uh, for this lecture. But, but the fact of the matter is my friends who study populism and Cass Muda in particular have been adamant that populism is a thin ideology that pits the true people against the corrupt elite and that describes a program for political transformation that's most obviously associated uh, with the center right and, and identity based political mobilization. I don't want to challenge them too aggressively on that, but I, I, I think that's not what we're looking at. I think what we're looking at is something more general and more problematic when we talk about populism today. And I can say this from Italy, because in Italy right now, we have two parties that are self-regarding populists, one of which is clearly on the right and would fit that traditional definition, and the other of which is in the none of the above category. <laughs> and we're not quite sure uh, what, to, what to do or how to characterize the Five Star Movement. And you know what? We've been here before. We were here in the 1960s and the 1970s. Because what we're looking at are people who are trying to assert political power from outside traditional political institutions. And in the 60s and 70s, these people were not on the right. They were on the left. And they were on a very peculiar kind of left as they challenged in countries that I've studied like Belgium and the Netherlands, the practice of consociational democracy and the strength of political leadership in the institutions that prevailed at the time. And as they challenged that, they were forced automatically into particular forms of mobilization that I think we would find characteristic. They used new technologies. They engaged people by their identities because they didn't have real media to intermediate their engagement. And as they put out messages, they put out messages that were a mixture of anti-elitism and a reconceptualization of the political space. Now, when we look at that in the context of the 1960s and 1970s, particularly with the benefit of hindsight, we can celebrate that as a benefit to democracy in many respects because it brought people into the political system. It challenged conventional norms, generated greater protection of civil liberties, and allowed for more equality to be extended across social groups. So there were lots of very pro-democratic things that happened as a result of that mobilization. But let's think about the negative things that happened. Those new political movements in the late 1960s and early 1970s fractured the center left in deep and fundamental ways, creating a cleavage between trade unions and the political parties that represented them in many countries in advanced industrial democracies. And, and, and along the way, created the fragility that would be exploited by the center right, 
by the end of the 1970s. So when we see the conservative revolution take place, it takes place across a division of the center left. And we can illustrate that in the context of the United Kingdom uh, as the division between the Social Democratic Labor Party and the Labor Party per se. Um, but, but, but we can find those divisions in many countries. So the point about disintermediating traditional institutions is not that you don't always accomplish uh, bad things, so you can accomplish good things by doing that, is that when you disintermediate those institutions, you break them in a fundamental way. And, and you can't be sure that when that first generation progresses and a new generation follows in its footsteps, that bad things won't happen as a consequence. Let me put it in a more blunt way. Emmanuel Macron is somebody who has disintermediated the Socialist Party in France. He's worked outside the French political system entirely. So long as he succeeds, we're okay. But if he fails, who rises to take his place? Because the Socialist Party that he has fractured is going to be very difficult to energize in an effective manner. And so will the Republican Party that he challenged at the same time. And so if Macron fails, we're gonna look at a fractured political system uh, that makes it very difficult for democracy to function. That disintermediation in the 60s and 70s fractured the center left and explains to a large extent why the center left is so weak in Europe today, exacerbated, of course, by the changes in economic performance that took place along the way. Um, but, but it's also been fracturing the center right more recently because the populism that my friends like to talk about on the center right is something that emerged in a different economic climate. The revolt against traditional political institutions started in a period of economic prosperity, but it continued in a period of economic hardship and that revolt on the center right is doing the same thing to our center right political parties that the revolt on the center left did a generation previously, as a consequence of which our political situation is becoming much more challenging to manage because neither prosperity nor hardship is stabilizing when it creates opportunities for this disintermediation of traditional political institutions. And indeed, if you were to look across political, inst uh, political uh, space in advanced industrial societies today, what you would find is that both the, the left and the right show disintermediation underway, right? So we see the, the extremes of left and right arising and challenging the mainstream in a way that makes the center uh, disappear uh, almost entirely. Now, that's a story about the disintermediation of traditional political institutions. Um, what do we mean about the, the delegitimation of non-majoritarian institutions, which is a phrase that I borrowed from Peter Mayer? Um, well, when we talk about these non-majoritarian institutions, what we're really talking about are things like politically independent central banks. These are institutions that were created to be outside politics in many respects. That's why they're non-majoritarian. And, and they were created to be outside politics in, in order to provide superior policy outcomes. So we give political independence to central banks in the conduct of monetary policy because we realize that if we allow democratic processes to interact with monetary policy making, Democratic processes would drive those policies in a direction that would result in inferior outcomes over time. Democratic processes would, would try to take advantage of monetary policy to ensure the reelection of the incumbent as the election approaches, uh, but then they would have to go out and, and try to calm down the turmoil that they created take the liquidity out of the economy after the elections take place. This opportunistic business cycle is one of the first things that led to the discussion of political uh, independence of central banks. But notice the response, the creation of this non-majoritarian institution uh, was a response to the inconvenience of democracy. Democracy is inconvenient in making effective policy in the monetary context. Well, Peter Mayer has a really interesting argument. He says, the European Union exists in much the same way. It's a non-majoritarian institution. There's a reason why the European Union has a democratic deficit, Peter Mayer argues. He says it was designed that way. It was designed to promote the harmonization of policies across countries. It was designed to force convergence in institutions in ways that electorates might not 
appreciate using arcane decision-making procedures that m most people aren't even going to understand. And, and without the real power for input into the political process, you have the opportunity to input into your national political process. But the reason for having this supranational organization is precisely to avoid the inconvenience of trying to intermediate between different democratic interests from one country to another and instead to allow them to negotiate at the level of the heads of state and government. Now this is a very interesting argument, um, but it makes a lot of sense in the way economic performance was happening because prosperity and the success of the economic model in the immediate post-war period made it possible to have a much more complicated division of labor across countries. And what we learned along the way is that this more complicated division of labor required a very high degree of coordination across countries in order to generate, to deliver, prosperity, stability, predictability along the way. And, and, and the more we work at generating that predictability, the more we have to accept that democracy is a little bit more unpredictable than we like in that context. Uh, as Peter Mayer puts it, if we could have democracy at the European Union level, we wouldn't need it. Because the whole point of having the European Union is to escape the constraints of democracy. Well, that makes sense if you can promise that we're going to have successful performance from one period to the next. As Fritz Scharf calls it, if you can legitimate these institutions in terms of their policy outputs, then you might be able to escape criticism. But can you do that? Central banks can't do that because central banks, although we don't tend to acknowledge this, exist first and foremost to be banks for banks. So whenever there's a financial crisis, central banks have to stop worrying about monetary policy and focus on stabilizing the financial system. And when they do that, the argument for political independence goes away. Because stabilizing the financial system is a very distributive project. You have to take money from one group of people and give it to another group of people. And taking money from one group of people and giving it to another group of people is not something that we can delegate to non-majoritarian institutions or bad things happen. I'll give you an illustration. And the central bank governor of Slovenia, a guy called Bustan Jazbets, was instructed by his European counterparts to stabilize two banks. And the only way he could do that was wind them up and impose the losses on the original shareholders uh, and, and investors. Uh, and, and, and when he did that, the Slovenian government looked at him and said, OK, now we have a problem because these people lost money. One of them committed suicide. So what are we going to do? Are we as politicians going to take responsibility for this? Or are we going to throw you under the bus instead? And, and so the answer to that question is pretty obvious. They threw him under the bus. Uh, and, and before his term could finish, he had to leave under a cloud of death threats. That is not a unique episode. Um, the central bank governor of Cyprus, Panikos Dimitriades, faced the same problem. He had to wind up the country's two largest banks. He had to impose losses on their investors. The government threw him under the bus. He was confronted with death threats, and he had to leave his job in order to protect his family. This is what happens when you delegate major distributive responsibilities to non-majoritarian institutions. It's very difficult for them to defend their own legitimacy, particularly when the politicians who sought to escape this difficult dilemma in the first place see no need to assume responsibility. The European Union works the same way, although it's less dramatic, which is why I lead with the central banks. The way the European Union works is that every time the European Union imposes a difficult decision on a country, the nation's political leaders, all of whom voted for that difficult decision to be imposed in the first place, come home and say, oh, look at what the European Union is making us do. Uh, this is our external constraint. Our hands are bound by Europe. Europe is really bad at making us do this, but we're going to have to do it because that's what Europe says. And along the way, they've been consuming the legitimacy of these non-majoritarian institutions at the European level and making it very easy for people to mobilize against Europe. I see this particularly in the context of Italy, where I live. In the 1980s, the argument that Europe exists as a vincolo esterno, an external constraint, was very popular as a justification for undertaking policies that national political elites wanted to undertake anyway. They needed to undertake these policies because they wanted to stabilize economic performance as best they could. But undertaking those policies were painful. It implied distributive consequences that they didn't want to accept in terms of responsibility. And so they offloaded that responsibility onto European institutions 
institutions instead. Fast forward from the 1980s to the present and you have one of the most Europhilic populations has become one of the most Europhobic populations along the way as Italy has actually seen popular attitudes toward Europe deteriorate quite dramatically. Uh, and, and the government that we have in place in Italy right now is taking full advantage of that, flouting the rules for policy coordination at the European level and insisting each time European policymakers say you can't do that, that these policymakers are trying to undermine Italian economic performance and prevent Italy from achieving the greatness of which it's capable or the just society which Italians demand. Now, this is a very challenging argument because as they've destroyed the legitimacy of these non-majoritarian institutions, what we see is that populists or these disintermediating of traditional political institution people on the right and on the left find this is the one area of common ground that they have. They don't share a perception of the true people, but they do share a perception of the common enemy. And the common enemy are the technocrats that live in central banks uh, or, or that work in the bureaucracies of Brussels. So the disintermediation uh, of, of our traditional political institutions and the delegitimation of our non-majoritarian institutions are all working together in, in a toxic way which brings me to the abrogation uh, of American global leadership. Look, there's a fundamental question that we should be asking ourselves about what's going on in the United States right now, uh, which is how can we explain that the United States is throwing away its privileged position in the global economy and in the institutions that manage that economy at a time of relative decline? The United States is actually losing power relative to everyone else. And so it's throwing away these dramatically important institutional assets. That's just crazy. Well, part of the answer has to do with the disintermediation of traditional political institutions. Look who's running the United States right now. These are not the foreign policy elite of the Republican Party. On the contrary. Donald Trump disintermediated the Republican Party and was rejected by their foreign policy elites. And so what we have is not the B team or the C team. We have the team that was trained to play a completely different game. And, and, and along the way, they're not just making mistakes. They're bringing in ideas that question fundamentally the foreign policy consensus that the United States had about the virtue of those institutions. Why? Because those institutions are viewed by a huge part of the American electorate as illegitimate. If you were to go to the American electorate right now and say, well, what do you think about non-majoritarian institutions like the IMF or the WTO? Uh, what do you think about the usefulness of the European Union as an ally to the United States? And what do you think about the UN or even NATO or the G7? And the answer would be the same in each of those cases. These are not institutions that benefit American national interests. They're not legitimate expressions of US foreign policy, despite the fact that the United States played a critical role in the foundation of each of these organizations. They've been delegitimated, and quite successfully. And since they've been de delegitimated, we have to ask ourselves what that means for the way America interacts with the rest of the world. Here's where we get to the other part of the answer about the abrogation of American global leadership. Um, see, part of it has got to do with this populism. Um, part of it has to do with the, the delegitimation of these technocrats and, and other uh, elites, um, but part of it has to do with the changing nature of power and leadership that's arisen in the turmoil on both the economic and political domains. Let me start by introducing a notion of power that comes from the writings of Hannah Arendt, right, in her book on violence. And, and what Hannah Arendt describes, she says, violence is the act of one against the many and power is the act of the many against the one, right? Uh, and, and if you think about it that way, what, what you begin to realize is that what the United States did at the end of the Second World War uh, was organize power in the form of collective action. Try to get the many together and where necessary, focus the many's activities against the one or more important, against the environment. So by forging this collective action, what the United States was trying to do was to assert American power. 
But what the United States realized almost immediately is that this power actually, the leadership in this context, it implies a significant investment of American resources. It's expensive. My colleague Michael Mandelbaum, or my former colleague Michael Mandelbaum, says global leadership is the provision of public goods. And, and, and what he means by that basically is, if you're going to get everybody to work together in some kind of cooperative way, then you're going to have to give them an excuse for wanting to do that. And that means you're going to have to subsidize their participation and, or ensure that they get a disproportionate share of the outcomes. And one could describe the way the United States built the international economic order at the end of the Second World War in terms like that. We could make it a little bit more austere and self-serving on the part of the United States or a little bit less, but rest assured there was a price that America had to pay to assert leadership in that context to forge collective action, and, and, and that price uh, is only going to increase over time, and, and as the challenge of ensuring that collective action uh, becomes increasingly complicated. Okay, so, so if that's the framework that we're looking at, um, there's a problem. This framework of collective action only works, and here we're going to shift from Hannah Arendt to Theodore Lowy, it, it only works if it creates predictability. Uh, and, and that's particularly true as these economies develop and as the logic of interdependence in economic terms becomes more acute. The logic of interdependence is a very simple one that was explained by Richard Cooper at the end of the 1960s. What he argued was interdependence is where when I set my policy instruments to achieve a specific policy target, I have to take into account what you're going to do with your instruments before I can be sure that that target will be realized. Interdependence is very simple, even for the United States, is what Cooper argued, that, that the United States cannot match instruments to targets without taking the activities of everybody else into account. So that relies on a huge degree of predictability, which is why we need these non-majoritarian institutions at the global level. And the more that we lose control over the economy, the more complex these institutions have to be. Now, in that context, the predictability we can think of as something like the rule of law. And what Lowy argues is the predictability only works so long as the leader in this context accepts to follow the same rules as well. The leader has to be predictable. But Lowy suggests predictability on the part of the leader is actually antithetical to true leadership because true leadership is being original, being assertive, being creative, working outside the rules. And so over time, the iron law of, of uh, oligarchy uh, is that, that <coughs> or iron law of bureaucracy that Lowy argues, is that the leader becomes increasingly constrained in order to ensure um, that the system functions as it's supposed to. So here's the problem. In the context of increasing constraint, uh, where the burdens of leadership appear oppressive, um, there is a new way that we can assert power. It's not about collective action. It's about control over uncertainty. Because if the whole system is meant to be predictable, if you can make the system unpredictable, then you can change the rules of the game. Now, this is where we move from Theodore Lowy to Michel Crozier. Michel Crozier, writing in the 1970s, said, control over uncertainty is the key to power in the context of a disordered political environment. Because what we can do is threaten the rules of the game and then extract a rent from everybody until we pull that threat away. Well, I don't think Donald Trump has ever read Michel Crozier, but he understands exactly what he's doing in that context because what he's doing quite systematically is challenging every norm and convention in international policy cooperation, those same norms and conventions that are designed to ensure superior long-term macroeconomic outcomes. He's challenging those norms and conventions in very precise ways to extract rents from the other participants. I'm going to get out of this treaty unless you pay me. And when you pay him, then he gives you back the same treaty again. If you look closely at the negotiations that the United States just concluded with Mexico, um, you would be hard to find Waldo in, in the context of this new non-NAFTA NAFTA arrangement. Uh, and, and, and yet there's a logic to producing the same thing that you had in the status quo ante, and that's that as he engages in that process, people buy rooms in his hotel and queue up to get exemptions uh, that they feel uh, will be profitable for them. 
as they wait for the new agreement to be reached. And so the queue of people trying to get into Trump's hotel is long, and, and the power that he's exercising along the way is considerable. And the worst part about this is that in the short run, it works. In the short run, he's actually chalking up what he can describe as victory. And, and yet in the long run, we're gonna reap the consequences. Because in the wrong, long run, the institutions that we had at the international level will be broken. They will be further delegitimated. And America's place within them will not be respected without an obvious replacement for the role that America played in place. So no one is gonna subsidize uh, these machines. So what are the implications of this? Well, I think there are three implications that, that I have to report, and I report these implications um, with, with uh, great trepidation and concern. Um, the first implication uh, of this argument is that without traditional political institutions, our politics are only gonna get harder to manage. And the more our institutions are disintermediated, um, the, the harder that management will become. And I say this in order to underscore my deep pessimism, even if Trump were voted out at the midterm elections, which is a constitutional impossibility, it wouldn't make any difference because the Republican Party is not going to be healed easily from the divisions that he created. Neither is the Democratic Party. And so American politics is in many ways going to be much more challenging. And I could make that argument in the context of the United States, but it's easy to make that argument also in the context of the Netherlands, in Belgium, uh, in France, in Italy, uh, in, in, in Germany, and you can just keep adding to the list. Uh, and, and I think this is a problem. It's a problem that Peter Mayer called ruling the void, uh, and the void is the absence of traditional political institutions to bring structure to democratic processes. The second is that without our non-majoritarian institutions, our economies are only going to get harder uh, to manage. And I mean that both in terms of the management of interdependence as we look from one economy to the next, uh, and in terms of the way we set our macroeconomic and even microeconomic policy instruments. Because there will be more political interference, even if the responsibility for that interference is not accepted by politicians. And if you look at the challenges that are out to central bank independence right now, you have to ask yourself, OK, I understand the legitimacy complaint about politically independent central banks, but what is the alternative institutional arrangement? And what kind of policies is that alternative arrangement likely to deliver uh, along the way? Uh, and, and I don't think the answers to either of those things are very comfortable. The third implication is that without US uh, global leadership, um, this situation uh, will continue to deteriorate. It will deteriorate because of the way what happens in one country impacts on all the rest. In, in the way the inefficiencies of the political processes and the management of macroeconomic policies uh, accumulate across countries. And I can say that very easily as someone uh, who lives in Italy because I'm looking at what my government, uh, my Italian government, is doing in macroeconomic terms. And I'm very acutely concerned about what implications this will have, both for the reform of macroeconomic policy coordination at the European level uh, and for the performance of European financial markets. Uh, and, and I think that that concern is warranted. Um, the United States could have played a more stabilizing role in that context. The Obama administration actually tried to play a stabilizing role in the context of the Euro, <coughs> Euro area crisis or the European crisis that just unfolded, but I don't think this administration is interested in that. On the contrary, uh, I've talked to people in the administration who actively are looking for opportunities uh, to divide Europe's, uh, one, Europeans one from another in order to exploit the advantages that would create uh, for their own uh, specific uh, policy domains. So what do we do about this? Um, because if these implications are true, then we're heading into a really bad period and it doesn't look uh, like it's going to be easily resolved. Uh, again, I think, I, I think the implications are, are, are three. Uh, first, I think we need to get involved in traditional political institutions. I always challenge my students, you know, how many of you are members of a political party? I, I work at a school of public policy. My students are studying precisely to go into public service and none of them are members of political parties. And that's troubling to me, because if they're not going to join traditional political institutions, then how can we possibly hope 
um, that, that, that the political situation will be stabilized. So I encourage them all to get involved, and, the, and, the, and I mean involved in an active way. That if we don't uh, want democratic politics to deteriorate, then we're going to have to invest in it uh, in, in individually and personally. The, the second thing is I think we have to begin to take responsibility for non-majoritarian institutions. We have to accept that central banks are what they are and, and accept the responsibility for the way they do what they do. And particularly, uh, I mean that in the context of the way we stabilize financial systems uh, and, and ultimately in the way they conduct uh, macroeconomic policy or monetary policy in particular. Now I say that with, a, uh, with the context of, of central banks, but I mean that also in the context of the European Union. I mean, if people are gonna support the European Union, then they have to celebrate the European Union for what it does and stop blaming it for what they want the European Union to make them do. Uh, and this is a very difficult argument to make. I've been making this argument for about 15 years now, uh, and, and I'm not getting a lot of traction. I have to admit. Uh, nevertheless, I think we're going to have to learn how to do that. Otherwise, we're going to lose the European Union because the people like Matteo Salvini uh, and, and Luigi Di Maio in Italy are actively mobilizing against it. So if we don't actively mobilize in its support, uh, we shouldn't be surprised if it go away. Um, the third thing is that we have to work hard to explain that international solidarity is in the national interest, that investing in world order is a good in its own right and not a cost or a burden that's imposed on national budgets. Uh, this is a very challenging argument to make. It's made more easily in the context of development than it is where it's actually most necessary at the moment, which is in the investment uh, in stabilizing these global relationships. Uh, and, 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 and unfortunately, uh, I think it's a very complicated argument to make because people don't like to transfer money away from their national communities and to other people uh, unless they get some feeling of moral superiority out of it. They, they, they like to do it uh, when they feel like they're doing good, uh, but, but, but they don't like to do it when they feel like they're doing what's necessary. Uh, and, and we have to explain to them that necessity uh, is acute. Now, if that's what we have to do about it, um, then, then we have to figure out a way to, to mobilize people, and that's what this project is about. It's about trying to set these themes out and then get people to follow them to their logical conclusion. Um, and in saying that, I think I would underscore um, that what this institute does is critically important. These are scholars who actually participate in the public debate. And the participation in the public debate, the willingness to take complex arguments and render them in a way that allows a wider audience to appreciate their significance uh, is first and foremost uh, the task that we need to complete. And I'm extremely grateful to Yvonne uh, for having me here to do that. Thank you. Eric, thank you very much. Stay, stay where you are. <laughs> Don't run away. Um, thank you very much for, for your lecture and in particular for, the, uh, for asking the question, what is to be done uh, at the very end? And uh, giving uh, uh, an insight into what you recommend to your students because this is about, to put it very simply, saving Europe and saving the, this peace project that came about because Europe went uh, into tragic wars for, for two centuries. And I think the, the long period of peace um, after World War II has somehow blunted the senses of the dangers uh, of dark times. Uh, even though people learn history and what happened to us in Europe in, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, somehow this long period of prosperity has um, has created uh, an atmosphere where uh, people want more, feel disaffected, uh, feel left out of the decision-making process because, as you said, suddenly we had times of economic hardship. Let me ask you just one question before I open it to the floor. Um, th this question of uh, the, the unbridled market, Wall Street, uh, for... 20 years since basically the Reagan-Thatcherite quote-unquote revolution, uh, we have seen the, the profit motive simply uh, take center stage. Uh, 
And what we had until then, a sort of redistributive social welfare state, all, all using simple, simple terms here to, to be as short as I can, we saw the fact that this profit motive led to huge inequalities that, that continue uh, to this day. Uh, someone like uh, my friend and colleague and, and, and colleague Varos Branko Milanovic has, has sort of demonstrated as other scholars have this, this huge inequality, but it has resulted in a dissatisfaction that has led to some of these political processes. Um, what, what is your view about the, again, this kind of neoliberal agenda? How much has it impinged on the two processes that, that you highlighted? So, okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much for that. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm actually going to start with a comment on, on this long period of prosperity. In the, the, the article that I, I'm circulating right now and that we're hoping to publish is, is one that looks at the last hundred years and frames it in the, in the language of, of uh, T.H. White's the, the Once and Future King. Um, and the argument is that, that just like the narrative of Camelot, what we did is we, we had a period of violent conflict. Um, and at the end of that period of violent conflict, we established an, a quasi-egalitarian organization with, based on the rule of law. And, and we propagated that, so our Camelot, our round table, and, and, and the knights who enforced the peace. Um, but, but along the way, I think we forgot, to a large extent, that we're all human, right? Not, not just the bad people, but the protagonists in the story, the Lancelots, the Guinevere's, and, and all the rest. And, 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 and as a consequence, um, we end up birthing someone like Mordred and ending up in conflict at the end of the story. Now, T.H. White actually wrote The Once a Future King uh, in the shadow of the Second World War as an argument for peace. So when I make this, I'm not just taking some Disney story and, and putting it in, uh, into an out of context analogy. Um, this is exactly the argument that he was trying to make. And what's, what happens at the end of the argument when Camelot is in shambles and Arthur is about to go off to his last battle with Mordred is Arthur knights his, his, uh, his steward. Uh, whose name is Thomas from Warwickshire. Uh, and he knights the steward and says, you will not go into battle, Sir Thomas, Sir Thomas Mallory, who ends up writing the original Arthur tale. He goes, you will not go into battle. I'm going to send you home instead um, because the only way we can keep Camelot alive is in the dreams of people, right? So long as the dream is repeated, it never dies. And I think, unfortunately, we're in, we're in that kind of a situation right now uh, where we actually have to reimagine this global system so that we can reestablish the conditions for the long prosperity that we just emerged from. And the reason that we have to reimagine is because somewhere along the way in that long prosperity, we forgot that people are human. And, and, and there's the critique of neoliberalism, right? Neoliberalism assumes that you can be human and everybody benefits, right? But, but there's nothing new in that. We can find that story told also at the end of the 19th century, uh, and everybody did not benefit, which is where the original populist movements came from in the United States. Barry Eichengreen has a very good book out right now on the populist temptation where he looks back at the origins of populism in America. And, and, and populism is not a bad word in that sense, right? The populist movement uh, actually spawned the introduction of the social sciences and the introduction of science into policymaking. So a lot of what we have as the welfare state today is the fruit of what Sidney and Beatrice Webb did or, or what was created out of the Brookings Institution. And these are populist institutions that introduced science into policymaking and made it possible for us. Uh, to achieve great things. I, I, I think we forgot that in the context of neoliberalism um, because what we assumed quite incorrectly is that the state and the market are somehow different. Markets do not exist without rules and rules emanate from the state and the state and the market are coterminous in many respects. Uh, and, and when you acknowledge that the state and the market are coterminous, then we can begin to make serious political choices about how wealth should be distributed and not allow wealth to be distributed by those most powerful people who influence the design uh, of market institutions. And, and, and that's what we forgot, and that's what we need to reassert. We need a more progressive agenda that looks at ways that we can structure markets so that inequality does not undermine their legitimacy. And I would add, this is not my argument, this is the argument of the IMF. So if you were to read Ben Still's book, um, 
most recent book on the IMF, uh, what you would find is that inside the IMF there has been a fundamental revolution from the Washington consensus toward a greater appreciation of the central role, Ben Cliff, uh, central role uh, of inequality in undermining both political and economic performance. And, and if we don't tackle that inequality, then we shouldn't be surprised if we reap the whirlwind. Indeed. Uh, I will refrain from other questions, although I had several, and I will open it to uh, questions. And Andras Bozoki, our yes, fellow you. here at the Institute. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Andras Bozoki. Um, Ivan just men mentioned the notion of equality. And I wonder the social preconditions of this political turmoil. So it would be nice to reconstruct the old center-left and center-right party system. Uh, but the uh, society is changed as well. So we don't have that class society anymore, which existed in the 50s and the 60s. So the class identities are replaced by religious identities or race or other things. So, so I think uh, the problem is a bit deeper than just the political level. There has important social change and uh, politics just responds to this, I think. Um, and uh, in your description, I completely agree with you. And if we, and that is my second point or second question, if we destroy the institutions or let political leaders to destroy it, then, then sovereignty comes again. A la Carl Schmitt, who is the sovereign who can declare the state of emergency. So that creates a gloomy perspective for the future. If the European Union is attacked from inside and also from outside, from Russia, Turkey, but also the United States, it is really a difficult situation that might, that might lead to war, actually. You were polite enough not to mention the Brexit, but I would also be interested in your opinion in this line of argument, the role of Brexit. Thank you very much. So, Andras, those are, uh, those are great questions. I mean, my, my doctoral dissertation uh, was a study of how the change in Dutch and Belgian society, right? So Dutch and, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands were, were organized uh, with uh, competing in mutually exclusive subnational political cultures. We call it consociational democracy because of the way they negotiated across those cultures. But these were deeply divided societies, and that presented a puzzle for social scientists. Why did these deeply divided societies, Belgium and the Netherlands, um, actually present such tremendous stability? Uh, and the argument was they accepted their divisions and learned to work across them. And that argument made sense right up until it was made. And as soon as it was made, those social divisions began to break down. What were the social divisions? Um, you were in the Netherlands, you were Catholic or Protestant or non-confessional, which meant you did not go to church. Um, but by the late 1960s, people weren't very Catholic in the Netherlands anymore. And the Protestants didn't really care all that much either. And the non-confessionals, well, they, they swelled in number and they developed a disaffinity for one another, liberal and socialist. So the society began to be transformed. And the problem with the Dutch political system at the time was that the institutions were not adapted to a circulation of elites. This is an argument that I get from Gaetano Mosca's classic, The Ruling Class, also called in, in Italian, Elementi di Scienza Politica. Uh, you'll notice the translation into the English title is really bad because it's not about the ruling class. It's about the circulation of the ruling class. And in Belgium and the Netherlands, that circulation was not allowed to take place, which explains why Belgium is on the brink of decentralization in a fundamental sense, uh, but also why the Netherlands is approaching the theoretical limit uh, uh, in terms of the number of political parties that can be represented in the Dutch parliament, right? Um, the, the, the Netherlands has, has uh, one electoral district, it's called the Netherlands, uh, and 150 seats. So it's a purely proportional system. And, and right now there are nine or 10 parties that are easily represented each time they go to the polls. That is not a formula for stability. So the, the, I think the problem you raise is a real one. If we don't figure out a way to generate a socialization or a circulation of elites within our existing institutions, we shouldn't be surprised that people mobilize outside them. So we have an engineering problem. 
that we face. But that also means we have to go back to our human beings and figure out a way to convince them to release political power because it's their determination to maintain control over those institutions that led to the counterculture revolution in the 1960s and 1970s, the emergence of new groups like Democrats 66, which in the Netherlands is now called D66, uh, to hide the fact that it's so old. Um, they're, gonna <clears throat> they're gonna do that uh, in, in new and more effective ways. Having said that, uh, if we can't organize a social uh, circulation of elites, then I think we do face the Carl Schmitt problem. Because at a certain point, there will be so much disorder that one person will come in and assert control. And, and when that person gets control, then you have to ask what they're gonna do to the institutions that they tend to occupy. Now, we've tried to avoid the conversation about Hungary, um, but if you look at the United States, <laughs> If, if you look at the United States right now, what's very concerning is not just what Donald Trump is doing to the Republican Party, where he's seating his representatives in the candidate selection committees countrywide, but what he's doing to the bureaucracy of the American government as he's pushing out people who otherwise would push back against his institution or replacing them with loyalists. And they've been doing that at much lower levels of the bureaucracy than previous administrations, uh, which means that the possibility for him to re-engineer the system uh, in ways that are favorable to his movement are increasing in, in, in ways that, that make me very uncomfortable. Um, or we could tell the story about Turkey, because in Turkey, what started as a progressive but conservative religious and yet open to pluralism political movement in the early 2000s has evolved into something that's, that's much more challenging uh, for, for those of us who want to see uh, open and competitive elections in, in, in free and liberal democracies. So, so I think you're right that that's a concern and, and it's one that leads us to a very dark, dark place. Brexit. Oh, the Brexit thing. So, so the Brexit thing is really interesting. They, they mobilized people against the European Union um, without people actually understanding what the European Union does. And when I say people, I mean all the way up to the top of the conversation. I spent a lot of time writing about Brexit in the run up to the referendum and immediately thereafter, trying to explain to people very simple things like how challenging it would be to leave the internal market. Um, because you, know, you can talk all you want about Brussels telling you what to do. Brussels is making 80% of our laws, right? Well, no, they're not. What they're doing is they're telling you how you can make product, regulatory product standards in ways that will be compatible with the rest of the internal market. If you don't want to do that, then you're not going to be manufacturing things that are going to be able to access the rest of the internal market. And explaining that very simple principle was remarkably challenging. Instead, what we had was a, a, a referendum of, of people who thought, well, we'll leave and we'll, it'll all be the same, right? Except we'll have more control without realizing that the implications of more control is actually challenging both in the domestic constitutional arrangement in the United Kingdom and between the United Kingdom and the outside world. This domestic context is actually really interesting to unpack, right? A lot of the power that's being repatriated from Brussels um, should not be residing in Westminster. It should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, to the Welsh Assembly, and even to the Assembly at Stormont. But, but Westminster realizes if it devolves that power, then it will fracture the market inside the United Kingdom every bit as much as leaving the EU fractures the internal market for Europe as a whole. And so what Westminster has done, and, and Nicola Sturgeon in, in, in the Scottish Parliament has tried to push back against this, what Westminster has done is actually repatriated the powers to themselves. So instead of Brussels stealing power away from the whole of the United Kingdom, Westminster is stealing power away from Holyrood and Stormont and Cardiff. And, and in that context, the, what they discovered is actually Stormont is not someone that you can ignore. The, the Northern Irish Assembly, the reason you can't ignore it is because you need to maintain free movement across the inter-Irish border between North and South. Um, and, and in order to maintain that free movement, you have to make sure that the products that trade in the North meet the standards of the South and the reverse. Otherwise, you have to put controls between Northern and Southern Ireland to stop those products that don't meet the appropriate regulatory standards from moving from one place to the next. That's anathema.
But if you allow for regulatory convergence between Northern and Southern Ireland, then either you have regulatory convergence between the United Kingdom and the rest of the EU, in which case you have not repatriated any power, uh, or you have to put a border in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And that's what Theresa May has finally accepted in her most recent proposal. What she's arguing is that, that eventually we will allow for border checks on the Irish Sea. Of course, her coalition partners in the Democratic Ulster Party, the DUP, uh, are not thrilled about this because that means that as Protestants in Northern Ireland, they're experiencing no barrier with the Catholic South, but a regulatory barrier between Protestant North and the rest of the United Kingdom. So bottom line, people just didn't pay attention to how complicated this was going to be, and they had a referendum on something else entirely. Uh, hello, I'm Melan Hanish, a uh, junior visiting fellow here at the IUM. Thank you for a very nice lecture and a very clear summary of the contemporary crisis and political processes. Um, however, I was wondering how uh, Germany fits to the overall dismal picture, uh, since it seems that um, it's not very much affected while by this disintegration processes which you described, and um, actually the alternative for Germany is not so uh, popular as it was expected um, and um, exp yeah only only a few regions Thuringen Saxony uh, there there we can see a popularity of, of these um, non-traditional parties but otherwise it seems that Germany is still uh, experiencing a very long stability so it, uh, my question is whether it has some um, something to do with a peculiar German history and post-war consensus, or um, maybe we can learn something from the situation there and, and the way how politicians there and CDC is to tackle the crisis? So I think, I, I think that's a really good, I, I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure I would agree with the fundamental premise about the, the stability of domestic German politics particularly as I watched the, the back and forth between the CSU and the, the CDU and, and the, the increasing fragility in Angela Merkel's leadership uh, of, of the, the Grand Coalition. Um, the implosion of the SPD, I think, is also a worry. And if we were to add the SPD and the CDU together in current public opinion polling, uh, you would find that they no longer have a, a constituted majority, which makes the Grand Coalition a little less than grand. And, and, <coughs> and, and I think that that's a worry. I think that that's a worry. I think it's a worry because of the way it's changing politics at the land level. I think it's a worry because of the way it's changing politics at the national level. Um, but, but I also think it's a worry because of the way it's changing politics in the European Union. Here, I, 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 I will try to avoid going off on a long digression. But, but the fact of the matter is there were many opportunities for Germany to, to engage in leadership of Europe and Europe's response to the crisis uh, that Germany missed. Uh, and when it missed those opportunities, um, bad things happened. The, the, the most important of those opportunities that it missed uh, was in, in late 2009, when Angela Merkel looked at Greece and said, every country uh, has to, to fend for itself. Every country has to solve its own problems. Now note, this was a change in German policy. Uh, P.S. Steinbruch, when he was German finance minister, had a very different tune that he read. In February of 2009, Pierre Steinbruch came out and told the finance community that Germany would not allow any government in the Euro area to go bankrupt. And this was important because it allowed the spreads between Greece and Germany to fall back down again and ensured the long-term sustainability of Greek sovereign debt. When that promise was lifted by Angela Merkel, the spreads widened out again. And when Angela Merkel uh, announced her ultima ratio in, in March of 2010, uh, insisting that no government would be bailed out that still had access to the markets, she all but ensured that Greece would have to be bailed out. And they had to magic up a bailout formula as a consequence. This is a longer argument. I'd be happy to give you the papers uh, where I've laid this argument out in detail. Um, but, but we're still living the consequences, and the consequences are an incredible inequality that has developed in membership, across membership in the European Union, an inequality between creditor countries and debtor countries. Just think about it in very specific terms. Um, whenever Greece needs help, 
The Greek parliament is deprived of power, but the help is only extended if the German parliament gives its assent. So democracy functions in Germany, and in Greece, it's ever more tightly constrained. There are good arguments for why that would be the case in terms of conditionality. We don't need to go into that. But, but the implicit inequality that this generates is not one that's good for the long-term viability of the European project. If you were to look at the Italian government today and ask why it is they refuse to follow instructions from Brussels, it's precisely because they refuse to be put in that position. Unfortunately, they may not have a choice. But if the markets put them in that position, and we could have avoided it with a political arrangement, then I think we're all to blame. I don't think that's just Italy. Uh, and, and, and in fact, if you were to go to Germany right now, you would find the main reason why a political solution will not be found for Italy, because the Germans, and I say this with all the affection that I can muster for Germany, the Germans don't see the reason for bailing out a populist government in Italy. And I think that makes sense, but unfortunately I think that's very short-sighted because the costs of not bailing out that government are going to be extreme. Um, Veronica Angel, visiting fellow here. Uh, now, Professor, you painted a quite a dismal view of Western democracy and um, other scholars would contend that and make similar um, comparisons. Uh, Hans-Peter Creasy at the uh, European University Institute argues that uh, since nothing happened in the 60s and 70s when we also made such dramatic um, um, evaluations, perhaps nothing will happen now. And one of the arguments is that institutions are constraining. So Western European democracies are in a situation that is much favorable than uh, the weak uh, democratic traditions of Central and Eastern European countries. So I was wondering how do you um, answer to these institutional constraining factors that seem to have worked uh, on populist parties in uh, Denmark, in Iceland, uh, even in, uh, let's say, in Bulgaria, they weren't as, um, even in Austria, it, they seem to be, to have a moderating effect, uh, these institutions in Western democracies. Because if you are absolutely right about the West, then how about Central and Eastern Europe? So uh, I focus in my presentation on the delegitimation of non-majoritarian institutions, but that doesn't mean our majoritarian institutions are, are, are actually in rude health, uh, quite the opposite. Um, and, and here I would differentiate between those institutions that have been disintermediated, like political parties or even the traditional media, um, and, and would focus instead on, on constitutional arrangements, right? So like parliament. One of the things that we did in, in this project that I ran on democracy without solidarity was look at how legislators actually used their positions in parliament. And what we discovered, uh, quite frustratingly, is that with great increasing frequency, legislators were using their positions to stop the functioning of the legislative process as opposed to encourage the functioning of the legislative process. They were taking good, well-functioning institutions and intentionally making them not work. That's problematic because when you take well-functioning institutions and make them not work, you increase the legitimacy of arguments for institutional reform. Institutional reform that might not take you to a better place. Institutional reform that make, might make it easier for those institutions to be captured at the end of the day. This is an argument that, that we saw in the context of Italy. Now look, the Italian constitutional arrangement, which operates on the basis of balanced bicameralism, perfectly balanced bicameralism, uh, was skewed by Silvio Berlusconi in 2005 when he introduced an electoral law to prevent the return of Romano Prodi in the center left. He introduced an electoral law that was designed to complicate the creation of stable majorities in both chambers at the same time. But since it's perfectly balanced by cameralism, the Italian parliamentary system only works if you have stable majorities in both chambers. The prote government that exists from 2006 to 2008 had a, a, ro a robust majority in the Chamber of Deputies, but it had no majority in the Senate and relied on life senators in order to achieve any kind of legislative victories until it fell prematurely. Um, when they brought a new 
legislature in, Silvio Berlusconi had majorities in both chambers, but he was weakened in the Senate by the need to rely on the Lega Nord of the day. And, and as Silvio Berlusconi got into trouble in 2011, that came back to haunt him because Giulio Tremonti, his Minister of Economics and Finance, uh, and his Lega Nord allies, Tremonti was not himself from the Lega Nord, uh, but was allied with them, actually prevented the, the functioning of the legislative process at crucial moments when Italy needed to restore confidence in its ability to show mastery over the financial crisis. And so Silvio Berlusconi's government collapsed along the way. Well, we've seen progressively increased fragility in the Italian legislative process time and again, up until finally Matteo Renzi uh, argued that what we need to do is to reform this legislative structure, both the electoral law and the balanced bicameralism, move to an asymmetrical bicameralism that would allow us more efficiently to create stable governments. And the people rejected that. They rejected that for principled reasons. In the public opinion surveys that we did, which had very large samples, repeatedly people came up and said that they would prefer representative democracy to effective democracy, uh, and, and that they would vote to reject the referendum because they didn't prize the effectiveness that the constitutional reforms generated, but they feared the lack of representation that these reforms might create. Unfortunately, in that context, what we ended up with was the worst of all possible situations. Uh, and, and that's what we're living with today, because a, as a result of this, um, we had the courts actually amend the electoral laws. And when the courts amended the electoral laws, they put us into a situation of perfect proportionality or near perfect proportionality that made it possible for anti-system movements uh, to rise up in strength, get a narrow majority, and then dominate the system. Uh, and, and, and that dominance, is creating a significant amount of concern. Why? Because these same political parties are now arguing that they should be allowed to do the reforms that Renzi failed to accomplish, that they should be allowed to change the structure of the legislature and the electoral laws in ways that will cement their dominance over the Italian political system. So even institutions that look as though they're in reasonably good health and are reasonably constraining can be perverted by the people who are responsible for managing them and put us into a bad place in the most advanced industrial societies. The, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, to the extent to which they're dealing with constitutional arrangements that are not well embedded in social norms and that are not treated with the kind of reverence that we regard the US Constitution are surely gonna face those challenges as well. But, but I think the point I would make is that they're more in a more extreme case, uh, but they're not unique. They're just on the same spectrum as all the rest of us. Uh, and, and being on that spectrum is deeply worrying for me because e even though we might look at Hungary and Poland and Romania and complain about what's going on there, uh, we shouldn't be self-satisfied in making that complaint. Uh, instead, we should be very attentive to the same forces and dynamics that are at work in our own countries. Thank you. My name is Sandeep Chawla. Uh, can we just try and uh, move a little bit outside of uh, European insularity and if I could ask you to reflect upon the drawing some sort of a parallel or an analogy between the experience of uh, the UN since the Second World War and the European project, where you've reflected on it in terms of the abrogation of American power, in terms of the uh, non-majoritarian institutions. But in, in, in the case of the UN, we created a system in which the democracy was only in the General Assembly, one country, one vote. In the economic institutions, we voted weighting in favor of uh, economic power. And the, the real uh, political power lay in the Security Council, which was paralyzed for 40 years by the Cold War, and then came into its own in some sense from the 1990s onwards. Um, in the context of the European Union, um, this, this paradox that you had in the UN was actually its weakness as well as its strong point because it kept the system going and it kept the system going essentially because America was willing to push very hard for these institutions. Uh, 
In the European Union, this did not happen. And is there something to be learnt from this for the future of the European Union, which means the future of the European project to try and deal with this reality that, as you've argued so cogently in several uh, uh, points that you've made, um, <clears throat> simply using um, democratic convenience does not always work in the long-term context, and we have to rebuild the legitimacy of some of these non-majoritarian institutions, uh, which uh, is a very difficult project at the moment. But what does, what does the experience of, of the UN teach us about this, and are we getting to a system in which somewhere within the European context, um, it's a will of the wisp to search for uh, what the global system had as the American champion. So but I think that's a really interesting question. And, and uh, here I should step back and, and remind everyone I'm a professor of European studies and not a professor of, uh, of, of uh, international relations that would give me the kind of expertise I would require to give you a, an effective answer. That said, I am a professor of international political economy. So some parts of the US system or the UN system I'm more familiar with than others. Um, I'm not sure, particularly as we look at the IMF right now, um, that, that what we're looking at is a robust institution. I think the IMF um, is an example of an institution that has needed reform time and again, and in which the principal stakeholders um, have been reluctant to make necessary adjustments, particularly to voting weights, um, but, but also to the, the operating procedures. Uh, and, and the Trump administration, I think, is, is going to complicate that. We'll see what comes out of Bali. Um, but, but I think that that's something that we should, uh, we should observe. I would say the same thing for the World Bank, but the World Bank group uh, is such a sprawling entity, I think it would be more challenging uh, to, to lodge a single monolithic critique. Um, I do think that the way the leadership of the World Bank group is selected probably needs some amendment. Um, and, and we could discuss that further. So I'm not sure I would hold it up as the paragon of, of virtue uh, in that way. But you asked a question about the General Assembly of the United Nations and about the P5 and the Security Council in particular. I think the P5 is very effective, but, but I do worry that the P5 is not very representative anymore. And, and in that sense, I think, we, I, I think we do need to consider whether that is an institution that's capable of adjustment. And if it's not, whether people are going to begin to ignore the P5 uh, or, or ignore the UN Security Council more generally. I think that's a distinct possibility, and I worry about that. I particularly worry when, when the US government decides um, that it can either get the, general, the, the Security Council to validate uh, its military actions after the fact, or it can, can uh, get whatever it wants from the Security Council and then do whatever it wants uh, anyway. And, and I think we're still suffering the consequences of, of those two decisions, by which I mean explicitly Kosovo and, and, and Iran or Iraq. Um, having said that, the, your point was about the European Union, and here I think I, I have something that's really interesting to add into the conversation, which is the effectiveness of the European Union member states in caucusing within the General Assembly. I was talking with John Negroponte, who was one of George W. Bush's ambassadors to the United Nations, and he said the, the Europeans actually managed to drive an agenda in the General Assembly much more effectively than he was able to do so uh, as a representative of the United States, because he couldn't get the Europeans to commit to any position until they had caucused, and once they had caucused and come up with a position, he couldn't get them to change the position that they'd arrived at. And, and, and they went into the General Assembly with vastly greater numbers than the United States could marshal on its side of the fence. And that, that leads me to believe that there, there is a potential influence of European integration that's gone underappreciated and that we should celebrate. And the, the, the question is whether that's going to be maintained as we go into the future, whether that practice of caucusing, um, that, that beneficial side effect of European integration on, on democratic practices at the UN level. What I can say about the European Union is that the European Union, unlike the UN, has engaged in an almost continuous process of constitutional revision. 
and, and in that almost continuous process of constitutional revision, attempting to bring new countries in, attempting to balance different concerns in terms of voting weights and, and, and the legislative processes. Um, the, the one thing that the European Union encountered uh, was a conflict between representative and direct democracy that it did not expect to experience. That conflict started in June of 19. Uh, 92 with the Danish veto of the Maastricht Treaty and has continued ever since. And each time we've gotten into that conflict, the, the lesson that's been observed from the European Union level uh, is that maybe these big constitutional revisions are not so great. Uh, and, and so what looked as though it was a dynamic evolving organization at the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, ha has now latched on to this Lisbon Treaty arrangement, uh, and, and it cannot evolve further because they're afraid that any significant evolution would force them back into popular referendums that would result in uh, the failed ratification like we saw uh, with the European Constitutional Treaty in, in 2005. So, so if I would be more optimistic about the EU than, than you seem to be um, in, in the 1990s, I, I share your pessimism today. My name is Klaus Prompers and I wanted to come back to Europe and to ask you, as far as I remember, you didn't really mention the xenophobic part of populism in European parties as well as in the US with uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Especially living in Italy, you must have noticed that Lega North now developed to Lega to get into the match as well in Sicily. And they, as well as AFD in Germany, and as Finnish parties, Swedish parties, Denmark's Gerd Wilders in Netherlands, all over the, country, uh, the continent you see, or all over the Western Hemisphere, you see a xenophobic push for populist parties from the right and the left. Is there any explanation Influencing this, influencing uh, the situation of European Union, I found uh, Bloomberg was very good when uh, the new government in Italy came into power, and they said they are much more dangerous than others like Poland or Hungary, because the Italian government wants to destroy the European Union from the inside, and I found this commentary very good. What's your commentary on this? So uh, the, the question about xenophobia and populism is, is, is a question where I, I wish I could do the, the, that tag team wrestling thing and tag Ivan Krastev in because he has his, his book, uh, After Europe, where he makes uh, quite powerfully the argument that a lot of the populist revolt that we have right now is a function of immigration and the xenophobia that that incited. That's not an argument with which I actually find myself in agreement. I would be honest, and, and it's not fair to say that with, in Yvonne's home without Yvonne here, but I'm gonna say it anyway in, in the hopes that he's watching us on TV. Um, and, and, and the reason that I don't agree with it is because, let's face it, a, a lot of these right-wing populist movements actually emerged before the great immigration shock in 2015, uh, or even before the Arab Spring unleashed the first waves of immigrants in 2011. Uh, if I were to look back at the anti-immigration rhetoric of Pim for Town, for example, uh, it wasn't an, a xenophobic anti-immigration rhetoric. Pim for Town used to like to do this with imams uh, on television, and I hope you'll forgive the off color of this humor, but this is the strategy that he played. For those of you who don't know, Pim for Town was a populist firebrand who was actually a very accomplished professor of sociology uh, and also a very accomplished uh, a magazine columnist for Elsevier uh, magazine. And Pimfortown was also flamboyantly homosexual. Uh, and he had two small dogs, and, 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 um, which is not, uh, not related, but I just like dogs. And, and, and what he would do is he would go on to talk shows uh, with some poor gentleman, who, it was always a gentleman, uh, who was supposed to be the representative of the Islamic community as though the Islamic community has anointed representatives. And so this poor gentleman would be seated next to him and Pim for Town um, would, would look at the camera and he would say, I have no problem with boys, Islamic boys. I've slept with many of them. Uh, and at which point the poor person who was supposed to be representing the Islamic community would go insane. And then he would look at the guy and pan back to the camera and say, this is the kind of intolerance we face. We're happy to take anyone you want, 
but they have to embrace Dutch values. And, and in fact, his argument was about creating a monolithic Dutch culture. It wasn't about xenophobia per se. It was about the preservation of this monolithic Dutch culture, which is an historical anomaly because, as I've mentioned already, Dutch culture used to be divided between Catholics, Protestants, and non-confessionals. And so this monolithic tolerance that he's talking about is completely alien to Dutch history, right? They were isolated subnational communities. You weren't allowed to marry across those communities. That doesn't sound like tolerance in any book that I've read. And so, so in that context, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, why is he playing to this? It's identity politics. And, and, and the identity politics can be xenophobic, but it doesn't have to be xenophobic. Uh, and, and this is where the, the Italian case is so interesting. The Five Star Movement is a populist movement, but the attitudes within the Five Star Movement extend from save them all, Roberto Fico, who's the president of the Chamber of Deputies, believes that we should be investing more resources and in going out into the ocean to save migrants and bring them back and give them a warm reception, uh, to kick them all out, which is the position that Luigi Di Maio finds convenient to take because he wants to align with Matteo Salvini. Now, how we bridge that gap, I'm not sure. But, but does the populism result from migration in that context? Surely not. But what has happened, and here I would agree with the thrust of your question, is that the people who have mobilized along identity politics in lots of different places have changed political discourse in a way that makes xenophobia not only acceptable, but encompassing. And here, I'll come back to the Brexit conversation. In the Brexit conversation, ask yourself, what these people were rejecting when they said they were against migration. They wanted to get control over migrants. Well, migrants from former British colonies, Afro-Caribbean migrants or migrants from South Asia, were already subject to the controls of the British government. The European Union made no difference in their ability to enter. The British government always had its say. Refugees and asylum seekers were also under the control of the British government. So people from conflict zones in the Middle East or North Africa who managed fortunately to get to London would be embraced by the British government according to international law and the government's responsibilities to protect. In that context, the only migrants that Britain did not control were people from Poland and the Baltic states who came in large numbers. But, but these are not people that are actually all that offensive from a cultural perspective. They fit in actually quite easily in, in the United Kingdom. So from a xenophobic perspective, um, they're not great targets, which is why when UKIP wanted to say that they were at the breaking point, the poster they showed was people from conflict regions, actually they were mostly from Sub-Saharan Africa crossing a fence in Tunisia, but, but that's okay. Uh, people from conflict regions who don't look like British people, which are precisely the people that the British government controlled in any event, right? But the xenophobia worked as a campaign slogan and managed to sway people into believing that, that all of these people who are not like the British uh, would be made to go away. Uh, and, and many of my friends of South Asian origin reported immediately after the referendum incredible outbreaks of hostility and violence directed at them by people who said, so think about it, if you're a South Asian person from Uganda who immigrated to the United Kingdom in the 1960s, they would be assaulted and said, you're supposed to leave now because we voted to leave the European Union, so you're out of here, right? That's crazy. A final anecdote on that point. The, the pollution of language in Dutch political culture by Pimfer Town has unfortunately made it possible for us to evolve from his very bizarre form of monoculturalism to Geert Wilders and his very aggressive xenophobic policy. So there, I think you're right. Um, but, but in Italy, we've had this weird evolution as well. The Lega has made it completely acceptable for people to say things like, and I'm quoting from a talk show here, a guy from a center-right party, so not a right-wing extremist, he goes, well, I'm xenophobic, but I mean that in a value-neutral way. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, how do we get to value-neutral xenophobia, right? And, and, and the reason is that we've legitimated forms of discourse that unfortunately make our societies more insular. Uh, and I think that that does fuel some types of populism, but not all of them. 
Eric, thank you very much. We've come uh, to time uh, in the library, but we continue uh, with what we call a wine and cheese reception for everyone here, and thus the discussion can continue. Uh, but uh, before we go, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for this really uh, riveting presentation, both in, a, in, a, in an academic, research, political economy way, but also with the very colorful examples that you have given us and again i repeat with the recommendations that you give to your students because i i believe that you know this work is important if it has impact in understanding that only by standing up and being counted and moving forward we can maybe address some of the pessimistic scenarios that that we look at so please join me in thanking professor eric jones Thank you.